the night had truly become what was now reality. But what was the sense of peace that Samuel felt floating above, confined within a tin can as the impending blackness of the void slowly consumed everything around him? It was like a piece of serenity had found its way within him, even though nothing was okay, and nothing would ever be okay. But, surprisingly, Samuel knew it was all right. Perhaps it was a paradox, but it was a sensation that could never be explained. And why would we dwindle down such a feeling to something that could be described? Wasn't that how moments were ruined? We couldn't put our life into words. We could only feel it emitting through our thoughts and through our minds. Was this okay? He wouldn't know. We wouldn't know. Nobody would ever know. It would all end soon, though, and that was the fact. Perhaps it was a piece of knowing he had made it. He would be the person to take in all the beauty before it was all dark. He knew he should have felt disturbed, but he didn't. Everything was gone, yet he wasn't. Could this be put into words? Why should it be put into words? It didn't matter. Nothing really mattered. We looked up to the stars and told stories of the greatness which could be found above. The places which we could only visit in our dreams, in our hearts. After all, there was a whole lot of space waiting to be explored. And yet, it was a mistake. Samuel knew perfectly well that the answer wasn't above, but more so within. We thought we could escape. A new world, a new plane of existence, pushing on into the stars. We wouldn't do it, though. No, we were too lazy. We'd wait until the answer came to us. <laughs> Sitting by those computers, filtering through incoming signals, seeing the reports of the unknown making contact with us, visiting them in our dreams and in our nightmares. Nothing ever came. We were alone. Beings who were meant to change the universe see that we were the ones meant to conquer the universe and someday call it our home. Ah, oh, there was so much to see. So many beauties which would sweep us over and would never be able to be described with any language. Samuel pitied them. As when they sat dreaming and waiting, Samuel found his peace. Within, there were answers. Even in the end, he kept looking deeper and deeper, so that an answer could be found. Yet all he found was this peace. And maybe that was the feeling we were searching for the entire time. Peacefulness. The calmness in the storm. But everybody wanted more. There had to be more than peace. And even if the world had collapsed and nothing was there anymore, there had to be more than just accepting it. There was a variety of emotions, ones that made ourselves complete, and inner peace was all there was? And that's all there was, at least to Samuel. We can't bind our goals into one. We all had separate paths we needed to take, but peace was the end state we needed to reach. This wasn't okay. There was a way out, and we could find it. In the stars, we could escape demise and create a new civilization, a utopia, one which wasn't riddled with problems. Utopia wasn't real, at least in our existence. Samuel knew this, but nobody listened. We sat, and we waited, and we listened. Years passed, and the threat of global warming was disappearing. Everything was getting colder and soon animals were dying out. We sat, listening for an exit to the above. After all, we all knew they were out there. Stories of government cover-ups, secret facilities in the deserts, they were all true. Years passed. We all banded together and used our nuclear weapons to heat as light slowly dimmed away. It was the smartest solution. Scientists had proposed the idea years back. But while we sat in our nuclear-powered bubbles and looked upwards, Samuel still looked within. They never did come. 
Perhaps they weren't there. Or perhaps they didn't want to save us. But we all went out. The lights in the sky vanished one by one. Until darkness was all that was left. Perhaps we'd all worn our time. In the end, we stood together and waited. Not for the rescue, but for the end. We watched the rocket fly away, and hugged each other and felt the emotions bundle up within us. We smiled. We cried. And we said that life wasn't that bad after all. Actually, it was great. Even if we hadn't reached our end goal, we'd still had a good run. Maybe we felt what Samuel felt. The last glimpse of hope in the universe. But perhaps we didn't. Perhaps humans all felt different. They all experienced a different set of emotions that then boiled down to a simple set of words all seemed the same. The world began with the bang, but it ended in pure silence. A look at what had come to be. But their time was over. Samuel's time was over. And that was the end. We weren't going to be rescued or saved. We were just going to have to live with it. See if anything really mattered. And try to see a glass half full. But we weren't wrong. Even if it didn't play out in the scheme of things. What we did mattered. It mattered to us. And even if the end goal was the peace. We all deserved it. Samuel deserved it. It was what we did, and what we all deserved. All the saints and the sinners finding the same prize after the run of a game we called life. And so, we weren't rescued. The paradox was true. We were alone. We were always and will always be alone. But we still had each other. We had our lives. And Samuel saw this as melancholy. And perhaps it was. Was this an end that got better or worse when we thought about it? Was there a secret terror which could be found? And if there was, did we need to see it? The end had come, but that was just it. The end. Or a pathway to a new adventure which no one could ever describe. This isn't a tale of horror, or a tale of misery and the end of times. It's a story of beginnings. And while we may look at it as a terrifying idea, that's okay. It is terrible, but we accepted it. Samuel accepted it. Can you accept it? Because, in the end, Samuel outlasted everyone else. But he truly could never outlast the universe. Okay, Mom, I get it, I said in an annoyed tone as my mother hung up on me. I looked out of the bus window as I felt a chill run up my back. This is where I'd be staying for the next six months of my life? Well, for some context as to why I ended up at a youth camp, I'd like to say, well, I was sort of a troublemaker in my early teens, and at the age of 15 I stole a car and crashed it into my neighbor's house while drunk on vodka. The judge gave me a break and only gave me eight hours of community service. I didn't do any community service, and this is what led to me being sent to the youth detention centre over six hours from my home. I'd love to tell you about the rest of my wrongdoings throughout my childhood, but I'm here for one purpose, and that's to tell you the story of the youth camp. It was an old complex that seemed to have been over a hundred years old at first glance, but it had some sort of unique look to it. There were three wooden buildings in total, most in good condition, except for one. It looked as though it had been through a fire of some sort and was a real eyesore when compared to the other two beautiful white painted buildings. The bus came to a quick stop. The bus driver opened the doors and told everyone to get off with that tobacco-stained grin that I now despise. He was a sign that Wherever I was, it was bad news. 
We'd driven into the middle of nowhere for four hours and just randomly ended up at the youth center in the middle of Nevada. Remote was an understatement. Nothing but sprawling desert beyond the buildings, as far as the eye could see. I grabbed my bag, provided by the youth center, and took a step off the bus. The air was hot and stuffy in my lungs, and the sun blinded me and it took a couple of seconds for my sight to come back. When I did, I saw a tall man. He was about 6'4", and smiling a fake smile. I could tell because, well, I was a master of that myself. He introduced himself as the camp's director. He asked me for my name. I told him, and he personally led me to my quarters. I made the bed that had clean sheets and blankets on top of it, and I relaxed until it was time for dinner. When my bunkmate, Lily, came in, I was awestruck. They were letting a boy and a girl bunk with each other? Even better, she was gorgeous. She had long, black, flowing hair, and her skin tone was a sort of olive. She greeted me and asked if I was her bunkmate, and I affirmed I was. She had a cute smile, and it was captivating. We talked and bantered for an hour or two until the camp director came in and told us it was time for dinner. The food was amazing. It was like a buffet in the middle of the desert. Precisely because, well, that's exactly what it was. In my mind, I could not wrap my head around how they'd managed to keep all of this food fresh tasting in the middle of the heat and the despair of the Nevadan desert. I ate and socialized with new peers. Jacob sat across the aisle from me, and we discussed who we thought the hottest chick in the room was. Quick to bond we were. Only having met five minutes prior, Jacob and I were laughing and joking around. Suddenly... A loud bang erupted in the mess hall. The lunch lady, as we called her, was standing in the middle with two pots, having just banged them together. She screamed from the top of her lungs, Who dropped this food? On the ground in front of her sat a diced piece of potato. Surely she was joking. She couldn't have been angry over such a small morsel of food, right? Slowly, the kid raised his hand and mumbled a quick apology. There was nothing remarkable about the kid, but I thanked God in my head that they hadn't gone on a witch hunt to find who had done it. The lady gave him a stern look and said, Come here. The kid gingerly walked over to the woman. She whispered something in his ear, then after a second of hesitation to look around at the room, she hit the boy over the head as hard as she could with the pan. A silent gasp erupted in the room, and the lunch lady looked around and smiled maniacally, with a grin too big for her small, delicate face. The kid was out cold. Some staff came and picked up the kid and took him to the nurse. The kid looked dazed for the next couple of days, and always scared and looking around, with worried eyes, and I pitied him. I slowly began to realize the true methods of this place. The week after the lunch lady incident, most things went back to normal, as though every single kid forgot what had happened to him. Even stranger, I couldn't find a single trace of him anywhere. I asked around, but everyone said they hadn't seen him. One day, I decided to ask the camp director if he knew where the boy had gone. He always seemed kinder than the rest of the staff. He had a look of fear pass over his face and he asked me how long he'd been gone. It'd been about a week since he'd disappeared, and I told him so. He promised me he would look until he found him. I was satisfied with this, and walked away. Soon, though, I started to notice more strange things. More children were going missing after being hit over the head for the smallest of things. I brought it up with the camp director again, and he looked horrified. I told him that three more kids had disappeared. One day, even Jacob disappeared. And nothing ever changed. I brought it up to the director yet again. He said nothing to me, just glancing at me. One by one, every child had some sort of incident and were knocked out by the lunch lady with any means possible. Pans, pots, her fists, 
even a two by four, and soon disappeared afterward. Lily disappeared last. She was in the room with me until we fell asleep, and when I awoke, she was gone. I felt a sickening fear in my stomach as I walked into the hall. I heard a faint sound coming from outside the thick walls. Soon, as I walked down the stairs, I realized what I was hearing. Screams. They became louder and more ear-stinging as I walked outside. The cabin that had once looked like it was mostly ash had magically rebuilt itself and was ablaze. Inside, I saw the camp director with a sad look in his eyes. Jacob calling to me for help, but I couldn't, or I would be engulfed by the flames too. I saw Lily crying while rocking on the burning floor. I watched everyone burn alive. Every last person from the youth camp died right in the flames, a mere distance of ten feet away from me. It saddens me that I wasn't able to help, but there was nothing I could do. But what I can't get out of my mind is through the flames and the screams and cries. I saw the lunch lady staring at me, her cold stare burning into mine, her grin as long and toothy as ever. Run! she screams. I do exactly this, running into the house. I feel as though it is a safe little barrier between her and me. Where I sat in my room, I could see the shadow of her outline in my window. I can almost see her large, maniacal grin now. The fire has stopped burning outside, and it slowly turned to day. The lunch lady was gone from my window, to my relief. I saw only sunlight pouring in, and no sign of her. I heard something peculiar. An engine running. I stepped outside and I saw that fateful bus. No other kids on it, with the bus driver with his ugly yellow grin looking at me. How was camp, bud? He says condescendingly. I ignored him and simply stepped onto the bus, and I was driven home, never to return. I don't know what happened to that youth camp, nor what happened to the kids there. I asked my mum about me going to the youth camp, but she doesn't recall what its name was. That's what's been so bothersome. I need to go back to find out what happened. If anyone has heard of any youth camps in the remote Nevada desert, can you please tell me its name? What can I say? I really love cats. Yeah, a guy like me, six foot four inches tall, weighing around 220. Looks like I'd own a black lab, a German Shepherd or something like that. Well, I'm a very gentle guy in nature, but can appear a bit intimidating when I have a flannel, jeans, and a simple beanie cap on. I mean, I like dogs just fine, but I just really love cats. I only have one cat, but... If I were single, I would have three. Cats are cute, clean, scentless, and require a nice clean litter box for their business. No getting up early, no walks, no doggy bags for me. <laughs> well, cats also seem to like me as well. They can sense things that we can't sense. My cat, Gibbets his name, is the light of my life. Well, second only to my wife. Some say that having a cat can protect you from evil spirits, such as demons and the like. Well, I never really believed all the superstitious garbage that was said about cats very much. Until last night. It was a typical stormy night in South Texas. My wife and I were sitting side by side on our laptops. We were just quietly tinkering away, and were enjoying each other's company. Her chihuahua, Brutus, at her side and Kibitz the cat at my side. There was a pretty intense thunderstorm raging outside as the wind chimes on our patio were twinkling away frantically as the gusts of wind swung them about in an unnatural manner. The thunder rumbled on and 
Flashes of lightning were flickering irregularly throughout the night. But... Uh, something happened. The power went out suddenly, and there was a thud coming from the balcony door that resembled the sound of... Well, the best way I could describe, as if someone hurled a sandwich or a loaf of bread at our balcony glass door. This startled both of us immediately. What was that? My wife said immediately in response. Ah, probably the cat getting into mischief again, I said with a look of minor annoyance. I'll go check it out, I said as I got up and went into the living room, where I guessed the sound had come from. It appeared that nothing was out of place at first, until I heard it again, coming directly from the sliding glass door of my balcony. Kibitz was on high alert, staring outside and hissing audibly. He was a very loving cat, and never hissed unless confronted with something living that he was unfamiliar with. Hey, what's up? I asked my cat as I bent down to touch his back and reassure him. He was completely fixated on a spot about two feet above the patio floor, on the other side of the glass. I looked and saw, well, nothing at first. I did notice, however, that there was an electric feeling surrounding us as we stood there. Every hair on my arm was standing on end, and some of the hairs on my head as well. I also saw outside that everyone's lights were also on, while only our power was out. I found this very peculiar, as I asked my wife to call the electric utility company to see if there were any power outages in the area. After about five minutes, she hung up her phone, and said there was no indication of any sort of power outage in our area. I slowly opened the patio door, peering out intently, looking for the cause of the sounds and my cat's visible distress. And then, I saw it. There was an almost completely transparent orb floating in front of me as I opened the door. It wasn't completely transparent, much like a jellyfish but didn't look anything like a jellyfish. It was an electric bluish color with a single red reptilian cat's eye. It had a mouth that was very large with a grayish ooze pulsating inside of it. The creature was fading in and out of sight. It turned to look right at me, causing me to freeze in place. The ooze from the mouth of the thing shot out at my face with lightning speed. It was whipping about like a bullwhip, and it caught my right forearm and caused an immediate burn slash that felt both acidic and electrical. The pain was white hot, and I yelled out, Oh, what the fuck? I screamed out in surprise. The creature went nearly invisible as it flew by me, and reappeared behind me, making a wet, raspy hissing sound that sounded like a snake hiss. Get my gun! I yelled out to my wife as it began to zip around the apartment, smashing into hanging model aircrafts and decorations throughout the apartment. She tossed the 9mm to me and I took aim, but I couldn't get a lock on it. It was just too fast. The slime from its mouth whipped around and smacked me in the cheek and the top of my head. I could smell my burnt hair as I ducked and tried desperately to keep an eye on the thing. Get Brutus and get in the bathroom and close the door now, I screamed to my wife. She promptly did. Each time the creature slowed down, it reappeared for a second or two. What happened next was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. The creature was slowing down and hovering about a foot off of the ground, hissing and snapping the tentacles of grey viscous liquid all around in a rhythmic pulsating motion. I then saw my cat behind the creature, stalking it while it was hovering toward me. I couldn't breathe as I took aim. Before I could shoot, my cat erupted in a pounce attack at the thing. He pounced on the creature and was kicking it and tearing at it with his claws and teeth. All I could see was a ball of motion as the cat wrestled the thing. A cacophony of screams from my cat and buzzing shrieks from the creature filled the whole apartment. It sounded like my cat was attacking a giant wasp. The creature then shot up and began to flail its viscous tentacles toward my cat. Kibitz was quick enough to keep out the tentacles away from harm, 
He was burned a little and had a limp from an injury to his right hind leg, but otherwise he was okay. I noticed that there were several deep cat scratches that glowed red and were dripping what appeared to be its blood or something like that. It was visibly weakened and I was able to get off one shot. The report was damn near deafening in the confines of the apartment. I'd missed the creature, but Kibitz was on it again before I could re-aim. There was a buzzing hiss as the creature was flickering in and out of view. I was able to procure my rubber-handled machete and made one swift, hard hack at the thing. I was shocked and burnt as I struck it before it fell motionless to the floor. I fell back stunned. My arm was thrumming and twitching as I sat up. It was dead, or at least appeared to be. Our power came back on, exactly at that instant. I snapped some pics of the thing as it lay dead on my living room floor. As I got a closer look at the creature that had been terrorizing us for the last ten minutes ago, I was astonished and amazed by what I saw. It was roughly the size of a softball. It was like a jellyfish with a large, red, and now dead eye. Its mouth was partially open, to reveal the streaming remains of its salivary tentacles, smoldering like a dying campfire. To this day, I'm not sure what it was, where it came from, and how it hovered and propelled itself around in the air like it did in my living room. What stood out most, however, were the cat scratches. They seemed to cause the most damage to the thing. The scratches were still glowing red, as if they'd magically cut into the creature's body. Now, I had intentionally left my cat's claws nice and long and sharp, in case he needed to defend himself against other cats and dogs. Well, I was sure glad I'd done that. My cat's not limping anymore, but he has a nicked ear and a scarred hind leg. He's as lovable as ever, and back to his usual self, working hard on taking a nap in as many places as he can. He was our protector last night. We know how effective and deadly the cat's claws can be. As I stated at the beginning of this story, there are many superstitions surrounding cats and their behavior. These superstitions go all the way back to ancient Egypt. <laughs> and now, well, I can certainly see why.